Welcome to Worship with Oakhurst United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Nathan. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you here. I'm the senior pastor of this church. Thank you for joining us for online worship today. We have a great worship service lined up. We're going to be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion together, so we hope you're prepared at home for that. We are excited to share with you that we are closing in on our fundraising goal to get these services to be live streamed so that you can worship along with us as a congregation on Sunday morning or whenever you want to worship with us during the week instead of having a pre-recorded worship service. And so that's a very exciting development. Please continue to give to that if you're able so that we can push ourselves over the finish line. Thank you to everyone who has already given to this project so that we can get that rolling. You're going to hear from Stephanie Fergenbaum in a moment. She's our Connections Director on how to get signed in so that we know that you're worshiping with us and that we can reach out to you and welcome you and thank you for joining us online. We hope that you have come to consider Oakhurst United Methodist Church, your church family, your church home, wherever you may be. And if this is your first time worshiping with us, we want to extend a very special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us for worship. Hello, my name is Stephanie Fergenbaum, and I am the Connections Leader here. On behalf of Oakhurst United Methodist Church, it is my pleasure to welcome you to worship. If this is your first visit with us, please text the word hello to 727-732-3550. If you are a regular attendee of our worship services, then you have already downloaded the Oakhurst app. So at this time, please open the app on your smartphone, click on the second banner on the home page or on the first banner on the Sunday page. Then fill in the blanks before hitting submit. This would also be a great time to make sure that your phone is on the silent or vibrate only mode. If for some reason you're not on the app, then please like or share our message on Facebook. Leave a comment on our YouTube page. And again, thanks for worshiping with us today. Good morning. Welcome to Oakhurst United Methodist Church. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come to you this morning, mere human beings, who are trying but often failing to be your servants. Please forgive our weaknesses and our daily failures in being who you want us to be. Help us to be more faithful in our daily lives. May we desire to obey you and what you ask of us in your word as an expression of our love for Jesus. Open our eyes to see the wonderful truths of the Bible and teach us to choose the way of truth setting our hearts to live as you want us to live. May we be eager to learn what you want us to do, for you have set our hearts free. May we love you and follow your commands. In every weakness, Christ, who is obedient even to death, is our strength. Help us to open our minds and hearts to those around us in order to show them the love that you have given us. We ask for your blessing on those of us who are physically hurting. Please bring your relief from pain. Watch over those of us who have recently lost a loved one. Please bring your comfort. We live in fear of COVID and unrest in our country, as well as in the rest of the world. Please bring your peace. Teach us your way, O oh Lord, so that we may walk in your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou Thou my best thought, by 
As we prepare to receive our gifts, tithes, and offerings today, we do so through electronic means. You can go to our website and click on the giving portal there. You can click on the giving link in the description of the video. You can open up our church app that you can download from the iTunes store or the Google Play store. However you choose to give, even if it's writing a check and mailing it in, we are grateful that you're joining with us on this journey. It's not just, though, about financial contributions. It's about giving the best parts of ourselves, allowing God's grace to flow and move through our lives into the lives of others. And that happens whenever we hand over ourselves, our hands, our feet, our minds, our time, our talents, our imaginations to Jesus. And so today I encourage you to hand over the best parts of yourselves to Jesus, that God might be able to use you to build God's kingdom in the world. So let's join together now in praying all that we're giving to God today. Almighty God, we thank you so much for all that you've given to us. We know everything we have is because of your grace and everything that we have been gifted with from your hands, you have entrusted to us so that we might become good stewards of building up your kingdom. So today we ask that you bless all that we return to you of our time, our talents, our imaginations, and our resources, Lord. We ask that you bless these gifts and those who give them in Jesus' name. Amen.
We come to that time now where we get to hear our scripture lesson. Today's scripture comes to us out of the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 16 through 24. I invite you to hear these words now. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not gotten into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, looking for Jesus. Let's join together in prayer. Almighty God, we confess that sometimes we don't know where to go when we're looking for answers in our lives. Sometimes we don't know where to go when we need some help, when we need some grace, when we need mercy, when we need a respite from the trials and the troubles that face us and assault us every day. Lord, we confess to you that sometimes strong winds blow in our lives and they make our own seas stormy and choppy and difficult to navigate. But Lord, we are reminded as we approach your word today that you are with us in even these circumstances. And so we join together today with our hearts and our minds to hear your word spoken into our lives and spoken over us. You call us to this place and this space. You call us to this time together. You call us to this table where we can experience your grace flowing anew into our lives. Lord, bless us today that we might experience your grace as we go in search of you. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Several years ago now, I was part of a young pastor's network that had the opportunity to sit and learn under some of the largest pastors in the United Methodist Church. One of the pastors was the senior pastor at the time of Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church. That's just outside of Dayton, Ohio. Now, it really is just outside of Dayton in a little place called Tip City. So shout out to anybody from Ohio that knows where that's at. But downtown Dayton was not traditionally where the Ginghamsburg Church was located. There were other Methodist churches in the city, and one of these, one of these churches came to be lovingly referred to as the Fort. Now, the Fort was in a, at one point, prosperous industrial neighborhood. There were factories, there were uh, lots of jobs and opportunities in that area, and so that attracted a certain crowd of people, and that congregation that had the building that became known as the Fort was built and it was brought up and it served the community well. It served the people in that community well. But as a lot of Rust Belt cities uh, has happened to them, happened to Pittsburgh where I'm from and Youngstown and all sorts of cities on the Rust Belt, as happened, industrial manufacturing left. And as it left, the housing market crashed and people started moving out of that community. And when they moved out, Sometimes people didn't move into those houses, and sometimes people did move into those houses that looked nothing like the people who had lived there before. And so the community that the fort was in, which was once a, a thriving middle-class industrial community, was rapidly changing. The demographics in that area were rapidly changing. The, the standard of living began to drop. The Population began to drop and age. The demographic makeup of the community began to shift dramatically. But through it all, the fort still stood. Inside the walls, the, the story was very similar in some ways to the community, at least in the shrinking part, as 
fewer and fewer people were living in that community and fewer and fewer people were attending that congregation. And over a couple of decades, that congregation found itself declining rapidly to the point where they could not keep up with the expenses of maintaining the building. At some point, maybe out of desperation, I'm not exactly sure on the whole story, but at some point a call was made. The fort would unite with Ginghamsburg. Ginghamsburg, which was several miles up the road in Tip City, but had long ago grown to this very large regional church. Ginghamsburg would enter into that space and reimagine what it could be. Now, it became the fort campus of Ginghamsburg, and the people who were left behind were invited along for the ride, or they were invited to find other places to go. What wasn't going to happen is things weren't going to stay the same. And so when Ginghamsburg moved in, they immediately updated the campus and they started offering a lot of programs that they had been offering out in the cornfield where they had originally been founded. They began offering recovery ministries. They began offering feeding ministries. They began offering nights of hope and worship opportunities centered around hope and recovery. They began to offer opportunities for job skills acquisition and after school opportunities for the youth and the community. They shifted the entire focus of the congregation. And what they found was the community started basically beating down the walls to get in. They needed these ministries. They needed these opportunities and they needed the hope that was offered there. Now, I don't know how big the worshiping congregation grew, but I do know the impact became immense that they were having and are having on that community. You see, what's happening there now is an extension of the legacy that that church was founded to bring. That church was founded to connect people with God and to bring hope to the community. And over the years, the congregation, the church itself, and the community all changed. But the purpose of why it was in that community should have never changed. It should have always been able to reach that community, but it wasn't until a new spark came in, a new direction came in, that the hope that Jesus offers and the message of the church was able to get back out into the world. When we read this scripture passage today from John chapter 6, I think about the fort. I think about the congregation that had originally been there. I think about what's there now, or, or at least was there a few years ago when I was up there. I think about that because as we read this scripture passage from John, we read that the disciples started moving ahead of Jesus in this story. That's not an insignificant point to notice. Jesus is on one side of the lake. The disciples get in the boat and they're crossing to the other side of the lake. And Jesus is not yet in the boat. Jesus is not yet there. And so that tells me a couple of things. It tells me that the disciples knew to move along. And more than that, it tells me the disciples knew to move into a place where Jesus had not yet been to open up a new community for ministry opportunities to spread the kingdom of God there. The disciples started moving there first. Now, maybe it was the Holy Spirit that we haven't read has been poured out, but maybe it was God's little nudging or urging them to do so. Maybe Jesus had hinted at it or talked to them or told them to do it, but the disciples are going ahead of Jesus so that they can be in place when Jesus starts coming through. And in this story, we read that Jesus follows after the disciples, catches up to them in the middle of the lake when they are at the most troubled point in the story. The winds have picked up and, and other versions of this story, the boat is threatening to capsize and, and the waves are cresting and the disciples are panicking. And Jesus enters the scene and calms the sea. Jesus enters the scene and the miraculous display of faith calls the disciples to believe in him. And eventually, even in this version in John, Jesus catches up to the boat and they arrive safely at the other side of the lake. Notice that's the first half of what we read today. But the people, the people who have been following Jesus, the crowd, the crowd that had come to know Jesus, the crowd that showed up to see Jesus, the crowd that had experienced the feeding miracle where Jesus broke the bread and, and there was enough to give to 5,000 people or 3,000 people, depending on the version, that crowd was still on the other side of the lake. 
that crowd that Jesus had been ministering to, they were left behind as they slept even. They were left behind. Jesus had moved on. Jesus had walked ahead of them. Jesus is no longer in their midst in the story. And so they wake up to this reality. And that's kind of the key, I think, to unlocking another part of this passage is that the the crowd woke up to the reality that Jesus was no longer active in ministry in their midst. And that's an important point to hold on to. If you're in the crowd, when that happens, you, you have two options, I think. You have two options. The first option is you go back to your normal life and you forget about following Jesus. You forget about going where Jesus goes and doing what Jesus says and experiencing the ministry and the miracles of Jesus. You just forget all about that and you go back and you live your normal life. And maybe in the course of living that life, you say, hey, I was following this guy named Jesus for a while and he did some amazing things. Let me tell you about him. And other people might say, oh, that's really interesting. I'd like to get to know that Jesus. Where is he? Well, he moved on ahead of me. I'm not quite sure, but but he's really special. He's really something. I can imagine that happening in their life. Or the other option, I think, is if you wake up and realize that Jesus is no longer active in ministry in your midst, you could go looking for where Jesus is active in ministry now. You can either give up and go back to your normal life, or you can go after Jesus. You can pursue Jesus. You can go looking and searching for Jesus to see where God's grace is flowing in the world now if you don't experience God's grace and goodness flowing where you are at in that moment. I think the church has the same option in front of us continually. This option. You know, the world keeps changing and shifting. There are always, and there will always be, some enterprising disciples that might move off in new directions, that they might move ahead of even where God is at work into new communities and new places so that they can open new doors for the work of Jesus. I think about the the first missionaries to some unreached people groups. I think about the first missionaries that came to the Americas. I think about the first missionaries that moved around Asia Minor when Paul would go into marketplaces and and they did not yet know that Jesus was moving in their midst. Jesus wasn't necessarily moving in their midst. God wasn't necessarily actively doing something. Provenient grace, yes, their hearts were prepared to receive a message, but the active grace of Jesus working out their justification in their midst, experiencing the and, and sharing the grace and the mercy that Jesus came to offer in their midst was not an active component until an enterprising disciple moved into the neighborhood. And that might have been at God's prompting or God's sending. That might have been because of a calling that God put on their lives. But the the enterprising disciple would go ahead of the work of Jesus taking place in that area. And Jesus often would come along, would catch up would want to be where new people were to reach and to bring into the kingdom, where new people were to to share and spread the kingdom of God among. That's where Jesus wants to be working. We see that in this story. We see that time and time again throughout the history of the, the Christian movement in the world, that Jesus wants to be where there are people who are in desperate need of his kingdom, his ministry, his work, his grace. And so Jesus himself might start moving out into new places and in new ways, doing miracles, perhaps when no one but a couple of disciples are looking just to build up their faith and call them back to faithfulness to the story. And so the crowd, the crowd or the general church, maybe, maybe you want to think about it that way, the average Christian, me maybe, and, and you maybe, The crowd has a choice when Jesus starts moving in these new ways and and doing new things. We can either go back to the same lives we've always lived, maybe without experiencing fresh working out of, of Jesus' grace and transformation in our lives, or we could follow. We could go in search of Jesus. We could go back to living our lives the way that they were without Jesus living off the miracles we'd already seen, the preaching we'd already heard. Uh, Maybe reaching new people isn't important. Moving in new ways isn't important. Or we can go looking for where Jesus is now. What is Jesus up to now? Because it might be different. 
It might be in a similar place, but a different thing, a new thing might be happening. So we can go looking for Jesus to see what God's kingdom is doing when it's out there on the move. That's our choice, though, to, to stay where we've always been and where we're comfortable or to go, to go in search of where Jesus is active now. It's interesting that in searching for Jesus in verse 23, it says some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks interesting to me that one of the first places that people from the crowd started looking for Jesus was in the last place they remember receiving grace from him, that place where Jesus had fed them, that place where Jesus enacted, in, in short, a, a precursor to the Lord's Supper, where Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks to God, and it multiplied to feed people. The, la the first place they looked was the last place they remember having a working, a transformative experience of Jesus. And you know, that's a good place to always start. And it's a good place to always start in one of the holy and sacred spaces that they've experienced God's grace in before. In some ways, it's much like our communion table here today. We have experienced, many of us, God's grace working in our lives before in this space. I know I have. I've shared that experience with you. This is a great place whenever we're looking for Jesus to start our search because the communion table, the table where the bread is broken, the place where it's broken and God's grace is poured out for us and a tangible sign is a great place to look for Jesus because of the institution of the Lord's Supper that took place here. It was at a table much like this. After all, on the night before he was betrayed, that Jesus commanded us at the official institution of the Lord's Supper to always take this meal in remembrance of him. And so at this table, it's a great place to go if we're searching for what Jesus is up to in the world because we can trust that at this place, God's grace is continually pouring out into the world. From this space flows grace. Grace is not some static force that we approach this table, we find grace here. We learn at this table that grace is ever moving. It's like a river. It's like a never ending stream that flows out into the world. And one of the rivulets begins here at this table. It's not the only place it starts. There are other places, but this is one place that we can trust that the grace of God is flowing out into the world. It flowed out into the world in this passage in John, we read, but that wasn't even the initiation of the Lord's Supper. After the Lord's Supper was initiated, we can trust that at this table, at this space, during this sacrament, that God's grace is flowing out into the world. It's a rivulet that merges into the stream of grace in the world. And so when we're looking for where God is moving, this is a tremendous place to start. Anytime we approach this communion table with hearts and minds opened up to the new thing, the new grace that God is ready to pour out into our lives, that God is already pouring into our lives, that God wants us to extend out into our community, perhaps in new places, to new people, in new ways, it's excellent to search for Jesus here because we know we will tap into that stream of grace when we approach this place. To search for Jesus here means that we should be ready to enter into that moving river, to have our hearts and minds and lives transformed so that we can see the new possibilities of God's grace in the world around us from this place, so that we can see and trace the river of grace from this table in the world to see where Jesus is moving, to see what God's up to. Notice in the story that I shared with you about before, it wasn't so much that Jesus left the building and, and the people never went looking for him. It was that they had ceased to flow, perhaps, on the river of grace that was flowing out from that space. They had come to the table expecting the grace to be a static thing that was just here, and they failed to notice the streams of grace that led out the doors. 
into the community around them. God's grace was then and always is attempting to flow through our hearts and our lives out into the streets, into our relationships away from this place, away from this moment, away from this table, into the world so that the world can be transformed into the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus crossed to the other side of the lake to follow the disciples, to be with the disciples who were opening up those new doors and opportunities. The disciples who got themselves into a touch of trouble on the way there. That river still flowed out from that space into that neighborhood. And when people showed up who noticed it's flowing still into the, the hearts and the minds and the homes of the people around it, that space was transformed again into another outpost for the kingdom of God like it had been built to be. It became a place of hope and grace and mercy again. It had never ceased to be, but the grace started flowing freely in that space again. They noticed, the people who showed up there noticed God's grace on the move. But the people who had been there had decided to get off the river. They decided to get off the river and wait to see if Jesus kind of circled back around to their spot. Now, what's interesting about the scriptures, when we read it, Jesus eventually would circle back around to the town that he had left. He goes to Capernaum and eventually he winds up back where he started. And so if the people had stayed and waited patiently and, and waited to see, they might have seen Jesus arrive in their lives again. But those who gave up and went home would probably never see the kingdom of God move in their lives again in the person of Jesus. Because they stopped looking for him. They had forgotten probably even the space where the grace had first flowed into their lives when Jesus broke the bread. You know, that can happen sometimes in the kingdom of God. It may have happened. I don't know the whole story. It may have happened at the fort. Maybe it didn't. But I do know that when people with fresh eyes showed up, that they saw the massive stream of grace flowing out from that place into the community of, in that part of Dayton around the fort. So the question in all of this for me, the question in this passage in John, is when we approach this communion today, table today, are we looking for Jesus? Are we willing to ride the river of grace out into the world, to let it flow in and through our hearts, our lives, our hands, and our feet? Are we willing to embrace the places to which it flows? Are we willing to open ourselves up and our congregation up to the new channels that it seeks to carve out in this world because God's grace is a never-ending stream? God's kingdom never stops flowing out into the world. God's call never ceases. Are we showing up, approaching this table, this sacrament, this time and space of celebrating the Lord's Supper? Are we showing up looking for what Jesus is doing in the world, knowing that this is a starting point, not a stopping point, knowing that this is an on-ramp to the river of grace in our lives? Are we here? Are we here to jump in the river? and to flow with it wherever it takes us. I pray, I pray that in our time of Holy Communion today, that each of us has just such an experience as we approach this table. May it be so. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you today. We enter into your presence today. We come to this table today expectantly, searching for you, searching for your will in our lives, searching to see where your river, your stream of grace will lead us, will take us. We know that some of us will be called to go out ahead and you will lead the rest of us to follow. And some of us, some of us will be waiting to see how you're moving. But Lord, we would ask that we would find ourselves pushed by the never-ending stream of your righteousness and grace and mercy out from this table into the world around us, that we would carry the kingdom of God 
that we find here with us wherever we go this week. That's our hope. That's our prayer. It's our expectation. Lord, may it be so in our lives. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We've now come to that time where we're going to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Now is the time to get your bread and your juice ready for this part of our worship service. We believe through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are united together around the table of God, around Christ's table, and we share in this feast even though we do not share physically in the same bread or the same juice. If you're in the vicinity, we make available at-home kits, and I'm going to be using one of those today for communion in order to share as closely as possible with those of you watching at home the same elements. 
and we can have those ready to be blessed at this time. Let us join together in this service of communion. Christ invites all to his table who earnestly love him, who seek to live at peace with God and one another, who earnestly repent of their sin. You don't need to be a United Methodist. You don't need to be a member of this church. You don't need to be a member of any church to participate in this service of Holy Communion. The only requirement is that you seek a faith journey with Jesus Christ, that you seek to follow him and love him, and you want to experience the grace of God present at this table. So at this time, let us offer up a prayer of confession. Almighty God, merciful God, we confess that we have not always been obedient to your will. We have not always followed your way. We have broken your law by things we've done and things we've left um, undone. We've not been an obedient church or even obedient disciples. We've wandered out of your will. But Lord, we come back to your table now and we confess these sins before you. We pray for your forgiveness and we pray that you would free our souls for obedience to your word and to your will, that we might follow more faithfully after you. Lord Jesus, our Christ, our Savior, and our Lord. Amen. I say to you these traditional words of the great thanksgiving, the Lord be with you. We ask now that you lift up your hearts to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. You know, it's right, and it's a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to God, our Father, the maker of heaven and earth. We join together this day in celebration with all the saints that have gone before us and all those who are still living, who celebrate this sacrament of Holy Communion, who join our voices together in praise of what God has done for us as we sing the traditional song of faith. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. For holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, he gave birth to his church. He delivered from slavery to sin and death a people free to follow after you. And he made a new covenant with us through water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread at the table with his disciples, and he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, that night, when the supper was over, he picked up the cup and after blessing it, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we gather at this table of Holy Communion today in remembrance and celebration of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ as we remember him offering up himself for us as a holy and living sacrifice. And we do the same. We offer ourselves up to your will and to your service, Almighty God, as holy and living sacrifices in union with Christ's offering for us and proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. We ask and pray now, Lord, that you pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice here and at home so that they might be for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Through your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at this heavenly banquet together on that day. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of your Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now I would invite you to pray with me over these elements once more. Almighty God, you lifted up the bread at the table and you broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. You lifted up your cup and blessed it at that table when the supper was over and said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. And so we gather at this table today and we ask that we 
feel and know your presence and grace in our lives in a very real and powerful way. Lord, let this sacrament of Holy Communion be for us a foretaste of the kingdom of God where we celebrate in victory that your grace is more than enough, that you've given to all more than enough. That final victory banquet, Lord, is that first proof in the new kingdom that your kingdom is an abundant kingdom full of grace and goodness where we can taste and see that you are good. And so, Lord, we would ask that we experience that grace at this table today. In your holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. I would invite you now to take your bread and join with me in tasting and seeing that God is good, for this is the body of Christ broken for you. Likewise, now I invite you to take your cup to lift it up and to know and experience that this is the blood of Christ poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. Let's offer one more prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the grace present in this meal that overwhelms our soul, that we can taste and see and know that you are good for the foretaste of the promise of eternal life with you. Lord, bless our souls, bless our lives as we prepare to go from this table into your service in the world, we pray. Amen. Stephanie again. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment now and register your attendance on the Oakhurst app, on Facebook, or YouTube. First-time guests should text the word hello to 727-732-3550. Have a great week. Will you receive the benediction? Almighty God, we come before you now, and as we prepare to depart from this time of worship together, Lord, we would ask that we would never stop riding the waves of your grace, that we would never stop searching for you and your places of activity in this world. So as we go from this place, let us go in the knowledge and in the search and in the faith of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Before you go, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share this video across all of your social media platforms. Thank you for joining us in worship. We'll see you next time.